for doing that. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome. We thank you for attending the SCORE Soccer Summit. We have a great presentation for you. We're going to take a couple moments to let everyone into the room, and then Angela will give us an introduction. Yeah, definitely right where you're zooming in from in the chat. It's nice to see how many folks are from all over the place. So we're here in the Bay Area. I'm in Novato, where it's a little chilly, but beautifully sunny. Alicia's in San Francisco. Dania is in Oakland. Yeah. Yeah. It's in California. And I see some friends. Hi, friends. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo, Oakland's in the house. There you are. It's always representing. So I'll go ahead and kick us off. I want to I want to start this with a poem for one of our poet athletes of no other way, I think, to inspire in the scores fashion. Um, and we're so excited that everybody's here to join us in the scores soccer summit put on by America scores Bay Area, where we serve over 2000, as we call them, poet athletes in the Bay Area. Nationally scores is in 12 different cities, partnering with over 300 schools a thousand coaches and over 12,000 poet athletes, which is amazing. So we're so happy to have everybody here. We could not do it with all the one, without all the wonderful partnerships that we have. Uh, and on that note, I have to give a shout out to our lead sponsors for this summit. We have Women in Soccer, um, who are, are bringing every woman they can together, no matter what you do for the game whether you're a player or a coach or administrator, what have you, together in one network so that we can not only learn from each other, inspire each other, but also amplify our messages. So definitely look for the link in the chat and we would hope that everybody would sign up. Membership's free, so let's grow our network together. Um, and then special thanks to to Go5, who is another lead sponsor and is actually doing a giveaway for each session, you could be the lucky winner. Um, goal five is giving away one prize to each attendee. So cross your fingers. Um, so with that, I'm going to read a poem from Mar Marina, who is nine. And she wrote this poem about soccer through the America Scores program. She says, you make me feel unstoppable. Like nobody can hurt me. The world is mine. You can always calm me down and make me feel free. You give me those incredible strong feelings deep inside like no one else could give except you. The sweet breeze running through my flowing hair. Who are you? It's you, soccer. So with that, I'll pass it over to Alicia who brought this amazing panel of speakers and sum it all together. So thank you, Alicia. Can't wait to hear from you. Uh, uh, Dania, right? Did I get that right? It's a beautiful yeah. name. Tanya with and, a uh, Okay, thank you for correcting me. I'm sorry, but looking forward to being inspired. Take it away, Alicia. Thanks, Angela, and thank you for everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. You guys are in for a very special and interesting, unique uh, presentation today or session. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, we'll be going through them as we go along. And I am very um, proud and excited to introduce da Dania Cabello. Um, she is a sports liberation educator and she's the first one of those that I know. So <laughs> that is very cool. She played collegiate soccer at UC Berkeley and she professionally in Brazil and also on the Bay Area Breeze in the WPSL. She is a entrepreneur artist, athlete, educator, and I'm just excited to hear your presentation. So I'm gonna let you go ahead, Dania, and take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me begin by giving thanks. I wanna give thanks to, so uh, to America Floors for hosting us, um, but I also wanna give like a big, big heartfelt thank you to everybody who's in attendance, who's spending time on this Monday afternoon to share with me and learn with me. I really, really, really wish that I could see you um, to get a sense of who's in the room, um, but I'm just really grateful that you're here. Uh, and I also wanna give a special thank you to all of the women who are part of this summit um, for their time, their labor, 
their expertise that they that are volunteering to share um, with all of us. And so I just kind of want to hold that and, and just give some props to the amount of women that um, are in this position to, to be sharing part of our journeys and our strength um, with, with all of you. And I, I'm certain that as attendees, there's incredible people that would love to also know your stories. So thank you for tuning in to, to part of mine. Um, as Alicia shared, I am a sports liberation educator. And the way I describe this to folks is um, part of my practice uh, is thinking about the ways in which sports can be spaces to heal where sports can be spaces for joy. Um, they're my own personal, and I'm only gonna share a little bit about my own personal journey before kind of getting into kind of larger issues with sports, is um, I was born and raised in Oakland, California to parents who were political refugees from Chile. In South America, they arrived to Oakland in the late 70s with my two sisters, uh, escaping political persecution, um, of which members of my family were murdered at the hands of the Chilean government. And so I grew up with my own unique experience of being a daughter of immigrants with a pretty traumatic history of or journey of exile to the very country who arrived to the very country that single-handedly supported both economically, politically, um, and physically with arms, the very uh, military movement that ended up ruining our lives. So it's this, it's this what I call the American contradiction of my family arrived to the very place that made their, their past life impossible to live. Um, and this is where they sought refuge. And this is where they raised their three daughters in California. And um, kind of part of this journey of mine of being growing up in a household that was really aware of our own political pain and the things that we'd experienced, um, having parents start an entire new life, learn an entire new language um, and try to come out on top um, with education, with access. And at the same time, I was also fully immersed from a small age into the world of sports, specifically soccer. So I've been a soccer, I've been a futbolista since I was about four and a half, five years old and still am to this day. And through my own journey with, with soccer, I didn't have the language I do now as a young person to talk about some of the contradictions. Um, there's a quote that I love to share with people that is inspired by James Baldwin, one of my favorite and one of, one of the most incredible authors, um, American authors. He says, I love America more than any other country in this world. And for this reason, I insist on my right to criticize her perpetually. And I borrow that quote and use it for sport. I love sport more than anything in this world. I love soccer more than anything in this world. And for that reason, I insist on my right to criticize it because I've learned over time that languages of critique doesn't necessarily have to mean that we are putting something down. Languages of critique can actually be ways of increasing love and respect and awareness. And so as I went in through my journey of, you know, playing soccer at some of the more elite levels in the Bay Area, playing division one at UC Berkeley, playing in Santos from Brazil, um, from Brazil coming home, reevaluating things, taking some break from soccer, but then re-entering uh, in 2011 for my first and last season with the Bay Area Breeze. And um, my 20s and, and 30s really have been about 
developing the spoken language for things that so many of us as athletes intuitively know, like our bodies know um, and experience a lot of these truths, but we don't always have the words to talk about it. Um, and so one example I give is around uh, certain rituals and practices that have become normalized in sport that oftentimes are, are violent and painful. And so there was a time in my life when I had a hard time identifying as a soccer player because I could only think about the bad stuff. Um, but over time, I developed kind of more words to put to the, the contradictions and that it's complicated. I can both feel sad about one aspect of my sports experience, but at the same time, I can totally love it and, have, and remember elements of freedom and joy and friendship. Um, and these things exist at the same time. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the memories I have that I'll, I'll only share a little bit briefly are around um, certain rituals that we do at play. I've become very curious about practices, rituals, ceremonies that we do. Sometimes we don't even question where they come from or why we do them. Um, but one of them was, um, it, it's not uncommon in sports worlds to have some sort of ritual of initiation. Like you join the team and everybody, a very simple one could be everybody gets a ribbon and you wear that ribbon in your hair. And then that shows kind of the unity that you've uh, devoted yourself to, to this team. Your loyalty lies with that group and that ribbon is a, is a representation of your loyalty. Unfortunately in sports, there can be other violent rituals that are harmful, um, that include violence in the languages and the, the words we use that become normal in sports, um, or even our actions to each other. And so one of the ones I share is, um, is you know, I, I had the privilege, I've had many privileges in sports, and one of them was being a part of the UC Berkeley women's soccer team. Um, which was an incredible uh, learning experience, an incredible um, time in my life. And one of the rituals that is common in sports programs and in sorority fraternity cultures, sports programs at collegiate levels often um, kind of adopt practices that are common in sorority and fraternities. And one of them are hazing rituals. And these are rituals that can oftentimes be very, very degrading and dehumanizing. Um, and when I was 18 years old, living it, I didn't have, no one ever taught me to, how to question or what, to, what questions to ask um, about certain rituals. And it wasn't until I, I left that experience and, and became a student of, of play I feel like I've dedicated my life to learning histories of play, rituals of play, and getting a grasp of where these things come from. That particular ritual, um, hazing rituals, which have their roots in Greek ancient Greek military practices, um, which are oftentimes those were like physically violent, um, they got adopted into the United to the to the U.S. and to the Americas by way of slave traders. And so the more I started looking at what the root of some of these rituals are that we perpetuate and we continue because we've accepted things as part of the game, um, we create at times a harmful environment for the players who really wanna have fun, wanna be healthy, wanna play with their friends. Um, and so I share this anecdote because there's a lot of rituals in our play uh, that have roots in colonial harm. And what I mean by colonial harm is the violence of both language, um, the physical violence, that the, the, the violence of capitalism, of exploitative labor, right, of like slavery, these things became more prominent through colonial influence. Colonial influence from Europe to the Americas to the global south. 
And these are the things which also, if I take a step back and kind of look at, okay, that's true for the world. The world influences how we play. These practices that have nothing to do with sport then become part of our rituals in our joyful places of play. And then in my mind, I started making all these connections between my own family's history of the ways in which um, some of my family members uh, were murdered by the very military that was supposed to be protecting them. I couldn't help but link all of these things. Um, and so what we see now as I make some of these connections is the ways in which our play sometimes perpetuates violent rituals. And we are not, you know, we're taught in, let's say, history classes or ethnic studies classes or science classes, we're taught to be critical and we're taught to question and look at the histories of things. But in the world of sports, physical education, uh, sports teams, it's not that common to center histories and to talk about the importance of critical inquiry, meaning critical questions. It's like we do that in every other class, but PE is somehow relegated to this other field where we're not supposed to be critical with our minds and our spirits. We're only supposed to be critical with our bodies. Um, that's kind of, that was kind of my experience growing up in sports. And so um, what, one thing I'm gonna share now is a, is a video, it's about six minutes, um, where it's, it's less about me talking and we can kind of look at some of the ways, and this is a video that I put together a couple years ago for uh, an exhibit at a Soma Arts in San Francisco. This was a, a group show around sports and some of the contradictions that exist in sports. And so kind of looking back at some of the history of our own country and the ways that sports has evolved with our society, we see elements uh, of violence perpetuated to the point where it's become normal. Um, and so what I did for this video, I'm just gonna give a trigger warning because the sounds, um, even though most often it's like the sound of a firework or a baseball bat, they're sounds that are actually from regular sports, uh, but it's over, it can be mixed with images of, um, you know, like a missile in the air. And so I just wanted to make sure that people were, uh, if anybody, felt that they needed to kind of mute it, um, that you could, but there's, there's nothing graphic or to worry about in terms of the visuals. Um, but I, I mix this in together and we can have, uh, please, if you have any questions as you're watching, um, I'll, I'll describe it a bit um, after. So I'm gonna share my screen and share this first video that's called, Tell Me How You Play and I'll Tell You Who You Are. Um, Share my screen. Okay. I can't eat that. And the kids around my block, they grew up with me. They can't eat it. And the kids that's going to grow up after them, they can't eat publicity. They can't eat gold medals, as Tommy Smith said. All we ask for is equal chance to be a human being. And as far as I see now, we're five steps below the ladder. And every time we try and touch the ladder, they put their foot on our hands and don't want us to climb up. Oh, <laughs> 
no van a saber qué, qué pasó con él, qué pasó con él, qué pasó con él. Pero en un par de horas ya van a tener el sistema, se llama que no se podía ver ahí también. kids to be tough and right, rough right. and play the game, they need to put them in gymnastics or ballet dancing. You play ball like a dog! It's physical. It has nothing to do with culture, society, or the patriarchy. Men are naturally better at sports. William Williams is a man. That is a boy. Este fútbol de hombre que ha tocado la cancha, ¿no? Este fútbol para hombres, para que sea claro, para hombres y para hombres. It's basic frigging science. Fast. No one can run that fast. Remind these guys to get their hands up, hands up, hands up. Told him to get his hand up. He had you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Don't shoot! Hands up! 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 Don't shoot! Don't shut down! The dream result would be equality, you know, justice for everybody. Uh, 
this is really something about human rights. It's about the people. This isn't about anything other than that. And some people aren't given the same rights, aren't given the same opportunities uh, as others. And that's really what the issue is. Thank you for watching. Every time I watch it, it gets my heart racing and I recognize that's a really intense piece that was curated and put together in a very particular way. It also is exempl exemplifies part of the truth of sports and the culture that we currently live in um, and the cultures with that sports exists in. And um, one of the things as a sports educator that I see we talk about a lot are themes of grit, are themes of discipline, are themes of confidence. And while those exist within sports, there's all this other contradiction that we need to name in order to heal them. Um, it's not uncommon for people to bring into the sports field. I mean, one of the things that this film really exemplifies is the myth of neutrality. Meaning when you enter a sports field, a basketball court, a soccer field, the volleyball game, we pretend in society that, every, that it's equal, that it's an equal neutral space because there's a set, set rules established and everybody's agreeing to play by those rules and everything is equal. What we don't often take into account is that when we step onto the field, we bring with us all of our complicated histories and multiple identities into that space. So if I have a problem with you off the field, chances are when I come on the field, that problem will reveal itself in different ways. It could be through talking, it could be through um, pushing body, and sports ends up becoming a space of that, right? If we look at the NFL, if we look at the NBA, if we look at the pay inequality between men and women, these are all colonial ideologies that have infiltrated into our spaces of play, which, you know, organizations like America Scores and the work that they do is looking to heal these aspects of sports and create a different environment for us to play in. Um, but if we are going to be dismantling structures that uphold this kind of language, violence, uh, we, need to, we need to be able to name it and identify it in order to transgress and move beyond it into a different, um, into a different possibility. Um, Alicia, I do want to know if you have any questions. I know that sometimes there are Q and A's um, portions. I don't think there are any questions right now, but um, I can tell you very powerful. Um, this is the truth. Definitely um, thank you for sharing all the knowledge so far. So great, okay. Yes. <laughs> to make sure that if there was, people can interrupt me for, for questions because um, your questions often make my perspective um, it broadens my perspective to hear other people's questions. Um, eh, so in thinking and kind of criti being really critical, like that film is like the high, is like the maximum of my like critique of sport and society um, without getting even more graphic, which it, it could have gotten. Um, and so in my journey as a sports liberation educator, I couldn't get stuck at that. I couldn't just get stuck at the critiques of the problems in sports. There, ha there has to be a transgression. And this is things that educators and academics like Bell Hooks, uh, Gloria and Saldua, these are women who have greatly influenced my, my work and, and coming up reading their theories of education as the practice of freedom. Um, I see Leah knows Borderlands, yes. Um, reading their work helped give me 
language to name my experience and not just the problems, but to be able to move beyond them. Um, because things aren't always just as clear as black and white, right? All these things can coexist at the same time, your joy, the tension, the fear, the insecurity. Um, and so in, as, a, as an educator, when I worked in Oakland Unified School District in the Fruitvale with students with whom shared similar experiences with me in terms of first-generation American, parents come from another country, there's a, um, there's this, yes, Leah, I think I'm getting to it and in, in, I hope I get to it, this question that you posed about my vision of what play could, can and should look like. Um, part of the journey is not just focusing on the highlights, but focusing on personal exploration. So if we understand that society has harmful dynamics of power that are upheld, right? If we look at, you know, ownership of teams, mostly men, mostly white men, um, and who's included or excluded from dynamics of power as athletes, which athletes get paid to play, which athletes play but don't get paid enough, there's the, the discrepancies reveal themselves. And in order for us to change our positions of power and to reshape and reinform power, we need to understand our own, where we lie and where we fit within these paradigms so that we can make actual change. And one of the ways in which I started kind of practicing some of my work as a liberatory sports educator was in the Fruitvale at Life Academy with the development of the Futbolistas for Life soccer program. And um, this program, unlike most programs that, soccer programs that have a soccer field or have a coach or play in a league against other people. Life Academy did not have a soccer field, definitely didn't have a soccer team. And there was no league at the time, Back this was back in the mid 2000s for students to even play. And so one of the things we started doing was looking at our own positions within these structures, right? So there's this common, uh, common talk that kids who play sports are more likely to be successful in life or go to college or stay in college, um, which, is, which is probably fact. However, when we look at who has access to even playing on teams in the, in the first place, and if students start understanding and becoming critical and looking at, wait, why don't I have a soccer field at my school? By not having a soccer field, even anywhere in my neighborhood, then already we're cut off from one of these benefits that is supposedly linked to success. So the Futbolistas for Life, they're a group of young students in Oakland and they started um, uh, basically doing research around their own positions of at where they lie within the sports pyramids. What do they have access to? What do they not have access to? Uh, who, what, which genders are celebrated to play? Which genders are not celebrated to play? And there was a lot of personal reflection around our own experience, our own privileges, our own shortcomings um, that also kind of describe how we get to how we are or what we have access to. And the futbolistas as a response to their critical inquiry around access to play, developed a campaign to raise money to build a soccer field on their school campus so that the thousands of students that are both on campus and in the surrounding neighborhood would have an option to join a team and so therefore having an option to continue to reap some of the benefits of sports, um, sports culture, team, camaraderie, friendship, health. Now, um, and, and this, there's also, a, they, there was a documentary made and I was gonna show the trailer to the documentary, but um, what, in, 
I'll, I'll send a link out later. Somebody can write it. It's the Futbolistas for Life, um, and it can be rented uh, online. Uh, and there is a short trailer. It's about two minutes that kind of explains that both these students are um, dealing with issues of being undocumented in this country or coming from undocumented families using soccer as an escape, but then also not just as an escape, but using it to politically organize, to raise money themselves, to build a field and change, not just the reality of their school campus, but create opportunity for generations of students that will come and play through that school campus. Um, and so it really kind of flipped this idea of like charity of, you know, one of the students in the documentary says, you know, we're not asking for handouts. The students raised $100,000, were recognized by the US Soccer Foundation, built a field in East Oakland that today is a really beautiful field on the Life Academy campus at 35th and Foothill. Um, but a lot of this started from place of, of being critical of like our own play and access. Now, pushing forward, as a, as a professional critic myself, I had to critique my own program because at the time it got highly celebrated. Like, whoa, you know, the Futbolistas for Life built a state-of-the-art soccer field in, in a concrete jungle of East Oakland um, where it's predominantly that Latino community that plays soccer, it's like as part of the culture. Um, but one of my critiques was this isn't necessarily sustainable or replicable across the country because not every community has a huge yard space to convert into a field. Not everybody knows the language of grant writing to receive the funding from the national foundation to do this. There's so many kind of barriers to entry of even making this uh, a replicable reality across the globe. And what ended up happening was after the first year of having the field in this community, in order to maintain it, right? Because once you put the field out there, it requires labor and the labor requires capital money to keep it going. The school started to rent the field to outside organizations that had the money to bring in the lights, to pay for the use, to bus and shuttle in students from completely other parts of town, uh, more affluent parts of town for students who were paying to be part of these programs. And essentially they privatized part of the field so that at five or six o'clock, every kid from the community was kicked off the field because it was being rented to an outside entity. And this is, was, was the very reason we launched the campaign was to combat that. And what ended up happening was the same kind of normalizing the pay to play model of who gets access to the field, who gets access to the fancy lights, who gets access to the profesh professional coaching. Um, inadvertently, this field was Re repeating the same harm. Um, and so as both an athlete, an educator, and somebody who's deeply committed to justice, it took me into a different realm. And so this is, there's a word I wanna share with you all. Um, it's an indigenous Nahuatl word. And part of why I share it too is because in a practice of kind of decolonizing the, the structures and the systems that we play, also using indigenous knowledge and language and centering indigenous knowledge and language is part of the process of both decolonizing and indigenizing um, in order to heal. And there's this Nahuatl word that Gloria Anzaldúa talks about that's called Nepantla. And Nepantla, N-E-P-A-N-T-L-A, -E is essentially a theory and a, and, a, and a word that means 
the in it refers to the in between world spaces in between and one of the ways she talks about it is that this the place of nepantala is kind of this when you when you when you live in between worlds right when you're undocumented but you live in america but you're not considered a, american there's this space in the in between that is both real and our lived experience but also holds within it a realm of possibility and that word I use and refer to over and over again because I realize that for me and for I think many of us one of the beautiful things about sport is that sport and play is the in-between worlds it is the in-between, the real, I'm here, I'm tangible, I'm, I'm playing this card game, I'm playing this basketball game, but it also holds within it the world of possibility, right? When the, when the quarterback throws the ball to the running back and the running back is running down the field and doing all sorts of beautiful moves to get away from their opponent, um, it's not planned, it's not super programmed, it's essentially, it's freestyle. And when we think about soccer and basketball and a lot of these sports that we love so much, what some of the coolest, most beautiful moments are when athletes reach, you know, we talk about it as the zone. And in many ways, that's, it's kind of this spiritual part of play. Um, it's hard to name, it's hard to pinpoint, it's a feeling, it's a movement. It's like spirit hit me and I did this thing and I don't even remember how I did it. I probably couldn't repeat that pass twice, um, but it happened. And a lot of times for those things that we don't have words for, like in our language, like in English, there's not really a word for that other than like being in the zone. Um, for me, it's been really useful to look at indigenous forms of knowledge and apply them to those spaces because many of our games have deeply spiritual roots in some form or another. I mean, play in general has spiritual ancient roots um, as forms of learning and knowing um, and creating. And so with that, I, and because of some of the limitations of the Futbolistas for Life program and the, the success, my work has become now around asking questions of freedom and the possibility of play. And so I'm a part of a group called Oakland Street Stylers that some people on the call here, Leah Morales is a member of. Oakland Street Stylers is a group of people that get together to reimagine how we play soccer. And so for us, it, it's freestyle with a soccer ball. So imagine break dancing with a ball. And instead of doing it freestyling at a soccer field, which we don't always have access to, or the grass isn't cut, or the field doesn't have any grass. We freestyle in public spaces to transform the public space, like the bank parking lot, for example. What function does that cement lot serve? Well, when we bring our ball and our music, we completely transform it. Um, and it's a way of kind of breaking down some of these barriers that exist within sport, right? So if you needed to play with 11 people versus 11 people sometimes, and especially now in COVID, during this global pandemic where issues of inequality are also being exacerbated right now, um, we have to reimagine how we play. You know, if we were trained soccer coaches and we were used to training kids one way for one thing only, which was to play 11 v 11, it's not relevant right now. It's just not an option. And so as much as our education needs to get a little bit more creative, right, rather than just being on Zoom, so does our play. Um, and our play is intimately linked to our joy and our joy to our freedom. And so I'm going to share with you, um, this is the last kind of the closeout of the possibility of play. This is what my freestyle partner and I do throughout Oakland. We welcome everybody to be a part of it, but it is a freestyle soccer movement. Um, and this video kind of helps show and explain the, the, heart, the heart space um, and the intention with which we play, right? Because we could be playing the same game, but if we have different intentions, 
and we could have very different experiences. We see that in PE all the time. There's the kid that loves PE and then there are kids who's like, I'm just here to get a grade. And they're playing the same game, but they could be having very different experiences at play. So with that, I'm gonna um, share this last video uh, of Oakland Street Stylers. And this is us kind of explaining what we do. Uh, in the beginning, you're gonna hear a little bit of mute, um, a muted glitch. And the first phrase is, we've gotten too comfortable with how messed up things are. Um, so just know that. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, here we go. We've gotten way too comfortable with up everything is right now. And freestyle is like a very physical expression against conformity. We want to be good neighbors and to be a good neighbor means to to see who is in your neighborhood and to um, connect with them even if they're not like you especially at this time where there's so much displacement and like people are, are literally having the places that they call home taken away and then the streets that they walk are now filled with completely new people strangers who don't look them in the eyes don't recognize them and so to be out on the street with the ball and to invite people to play, which you watch is an opportunity to connect with their neighbors and just to validate their very existence. there to be seen, we're out there to roll around, we're out there to turn the BART station into a space of joy. The same BART station where Neil Wilson was murdered. The same BART line that has torn whole communities apart, um, separated, you know, people's livelihoods, families, um, can be a, a site to repair, to connect, to play. Well, music in itself has the power to to change. So we, we are literally changing the, the, the sonic frequencies of, of the bar stations or places that we're at. It turns our environment to a playground. And if you think about a playground you know, where kids go and play, there's many children who don't know each other, but they meet up at the slides, they meet up at the swings, and they make games up. And they had a great moment of play and brighten their day and move on. And all those add up to hopefully happy people. As you say, all you need is a ball and uh, you can make a ball out of trash. And if you can make a ball out of trash and you can, if you can get free with a piece of trash, then what else can you get free with? Traditional sports follow the same oppressive rules that dominate in our society. And so this is where I want to play. This is where I wanna see my people. This is where I can be on the land. And that's what this is about. Freedom and the health of our community. All right, so that's a little bit on the possibility of play and some of the more recent work that I do with freestyle soccer. Um, yeah, I know I feel like I've been talking a lot. This uh, presentation was mostly intended to kind of sprinkle you through some of the journey that I have been on as, a, as an athlete and an educator and somebody who's deeply committed to healing our collective spaces. Um, and so, you know, I, this presentation could have been just one on one aspect of what we touched on today, um, but I would really love to know any questions that you might have reflections. Thank you so much.
Hi, Dania. That was so wonderful. Um, maybe look at sport in a whole different way. Um, and I am actually going to go back to Leah's comment. And what do you envision for the future? What do you see in five to 10 years, how soccer can look and how the community can work together? And maybe what are some action items we can do to make it possible? That's a great question. So thank you. And thank you, Leah, for asking it. Um, one of the ones I would love to see is I, we've kind of lost the play element and the freestyle element of just playing. We, we've monetized it. We've professionalized it, right? 12-year-olds are on track and they train like the pros. And somewhere in there, we're losing the joy of playing sports um, and that's you know 12 13 years old is when kids are kind of either opting into the serious life of play or they're opting out completely and so my my my, my hope and and through the work that we're doing with oakland street stylers is to recenter our joy in spaces of play so that we see people playing in the streets again we see kids juggling um, their soccer balls at the park, not just when it's time for soccer practice, that we see people have fun and put on some music um, to kind of break down this idea that the only way to play is if we are part of a hyper-organized, scheduled training regiment. Um, and so, you know, some of the tangibles is to to be it. It's not just about telling young people to go play. It's asking the adults, when was the last time you played? What do you play? How do we play and, and, and express ourselves? Um, and so I think there's kind of some ownership of like just being it, going to the park, um, you know, meeting the people who run the park, uh, bringing your ball into different spaces and just kind of living it while then also trying to kind of educate around it um, but sometimes there's a discrepancy between kind of the, the teaching of it and the living of it. And so I would love to see more people of all genders and all ages normalizing that we play and that play is not just relegated to children's, um, the children's work. It's, it's all of our work and it's part of all of our expression of creativity and freedom. Thank you so much. We have a question here from Courtney. Uh, fantastic artistic expression, Dania. Do you have a favorite suggestion to reconstructing play for coaches trying to recenter joy for their teams? It's also serious right now. Please help the coaches. Yeah. You know, um, first of all, hello, Courtney. I love you. <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for this question. Yes. I think and things are serious right now. Um, so I, the short, there's two answers. One is, is kind of along the lines of like, just get out there and roll around, like almost like the performance of like getting extra silly with our bodies and like re remembering that our bodies are meant for more than just sitting at the computer. Um, and, and, and bringing the music and asking the kids, what's your favorite song right now? And just like, you know, and, and freestyle in, is something that we can do safely in a social distance environment, right? All you need is a ball and yourself. Um, you don't need to pass it back and forth. You don't need crazy coolest soccer cleats and equipment. Um, so at its core, it can be pretty simply replicated to just get to know different, um, movements with the ball. But the other kind of the more long term is, you know, sometimes when I'm playing, it's not that I'm doing anything that different than what I was used to do. But because I've spent so much time reading theory, and I think that's something that coaches, we often are told to read like the book on coaching. Um, but we're not taught, we're not told to read like bell hooks, Gloria and Saldua and a Paolo Freire, and to think about how our profession as coaches, how we can adopt these big theories into our work. 
So sometimes it's not even that you're having to super explain to kids, it's that our own mind is shifting. And with that, the intention with which we play shifts and we enjoy it more. Even if it looks like the same militaristic training, when the intention is different, the experience can be different. So that's kind of my, my, two, my two thoughts on that. And happy to share more reading lists with people that are like, well, I want to know what other books. <laughs> I, I definitely think you should share <laughs> links. And how can people get a hold of you? We have some people that Jay Reyes wants to brainstorm with you. Oh, amazing. Yes, I am available for brainstorming um, and hire, you know, because um, the labor is real. And you can get a hold of me at how do I do this? I'll share my email here, panelists and attendees. Um, the best way is email vanya8 at gmail.com. Um, that's a great way to get a hold of me. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Oakland Street Stylers, where we will be updating kind of movements that we're doing in Oakland. We just were recipients of the Just City Award. Um, we were one of 12 uh, community artists um, who received investment uh, and for our project, the possibility of play, of resurfacing some of the, the forgotten histories of, of Oakland Parks and Rec and how play can be part of our, our freedom. So uh, there will be updates over the next year that involve um, the possibility of play and the work with Oakland Street Stylers. Thank you, Danielle. We have one more question from Courtney. Alicia, you just went on mute. Okay, I'm back, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what about some language for coaches who find themselves in need of justifying the playful side of the game to their parent groups, pushing an agenda grounded in the seriousness we are, we are supportive and rebelling against? Mm, wow. Bless you, Courtney, for still dealing with parents. This is part of why I am not, I am not um, in the line of coaching. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel I don't have a very clear answer or conclusion on this. I only have like a suggestion, which is sometimes breaking down almost like a presentation, kind of in that like the hard truth of that first video I shared, how it, it kind of makes you uncomfortable, but get it like creating a presentation that names the harms that we perpetuate when we hold our children to these unrealistic and unhealthy expectations. Um, and when we, when we move so far away uh, from the creative and the imaginative and the freestyle elements, I mean, this pandemic is highlighting this so much right now. We don't need more of the same. We need drastic change. Drastic change only comes when we can imagine and be creative with our ways of moving, our ways of using our money, our ways of treating each other. Um, and so if ever there was a time, I would love to sit in on your presentation about how you communicate some of this with parents. So why don't you let us know um, what you do? That's just kind of some of my thoughts. We're, we're killing the creativity out of children um, in many ways. And, and sometimes sports is one of them. Thank you so much, Dania. Um, I'm a little over two, um, but I think we could probably keep going. And I would love, love to have you come back at some point and um, we can dwell into this more because it's such an interesting thing and so well needed. Um, on behalf of SCORES, thank you so much for um, being here today with us and being one of our stellar speakers. We have um, Casey Gray coming up at three o'clock. I think she's on right now. And she's going to talk about the female mindset. And tomorrow through Friday, we have tons more great speakers. So I hope everyone signs up. And um, thanks to our two partners, Women in, Women in Soccer, free membership, and everyone who is in Anything to do with soccer should sign up. And then goal five, thank you so much for your um, partnership. And just so everyone knows, somebody in the audience today is going to work, uh, is going to win a giveaway from goal five. So thank you to them. All right, um, Daniel, thank you so much again. And we Bye. will see you at three, hopefully. Beautiful. Have a good day. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>